Hello everybody, this is Chuck Carnivale, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, bringing you another Analyze Out Loud video. If you like these videos and find them worth your while, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button here at the bottom of YouTube. And this is part of a series of sectors where I'll be covering 20 sectors. I've covered the 13th sector, Mont Energy Minerals. And this is not a sector that I'm very keen on investing in, but I thought it was a very interesting sector to cover because it does illustrate a couple of very important principles about being a value investor or being a long-term buy and hold investor. For one thing, and let me go into these companies, I want you to notice these are tend to be very commodity-based companies. You've got copper, forest products, steel, it's you know, aluminum, etc. So let's start. I'm going to go first, I'm going to go into Worthington Industries here. Now this happens to be one of the better examples of companies that I might even possibly consider investing in. In this sector. One of the attributes that this sector seems to have in common is a lot of cyclicality. So I want you to notice the orange and blue line on this graph, they're actually both lines. You'll see that's the orange and there's the blue. They're almost identical. They're both running at a PE ratio of 14.6 on the blue and 15 on the orange line. Notice how earnings go up and down. Look at the cyclicality of earnings. And what's really important is that know how the price follows that. This is a clear example of how price tracks earnings over the long run. And what that means from an investment perspective is that in the long run, the business results are a lot more important than the short-term volatility of stock prices. Even with this particular amount of earnings volatility, a lot of cyclicality, I call it ups and downs, it's still nowhere near as jagged a line as the monthly closing stock prices here. But what you see here is a company that has a very his cyclical historical background. Dividends here were very flat for all these years. You can see that. That's the white line on the graph. Then they cut them during the Great Recession. And then we've had pretty decent dividend growth for the last couple of years. You see clear periods of overvaluation, and you see clear periods of undervaluation, and you see a continuous reversion to the mean. But the biggest lesson here is, in the long run, the business results drive the stock prices and the returns. And living with a stock like this, this is more of a trading stock, in my opinion, than a long-term buy and hold. The long-term performance on this company is actually not horrible. Dividend record was actually better than the S&P 500. This is going back to January 31st of 2000. The rate of return was actually slightly better than the market. Again, it just happens to be for this particular time frame, but I want you to notice how erratic everything was. So anyway, this is not the kind of company that I'd want to buy and hold. Now, if I look at forecasting, there's not a lot of analysts following the stock, only three. If you look at the analyst scorecard, this is a just a point that you're going to see, generally speaking, on these companies. If you look at the record, there's a lot of misses. In other words, this is a very hard company to forecast because of how cyclical the stock prices are. My next example is Arconic, which is actually the old aluminum company of America. And I point this stock out. There's very little history here. This company was reorganized and went public in October of 2016 under the name Arconic. But what they essentially did was they eliminated all of the cyclical history that Alcoa had actually shown. But once again, you see something that I don't consider as very reliable. One is you see pretty consistent earnings growth after the first year here, you almost really need to shorten this graph to where you eliminate that first year because it's kind of an anomalous year. So the company looks like it has decent earnings growth. Look at their dividend. Their dividend was 24 cents and now they've cut it to 8 cents. And again, when you look at this long term, it looks like it might be an attractive investment. And the analyst scorecard is even good. But the problem is there's not enough history here for me to get comfortable. So this would be one that you might want to consider. It's certainly a known name, you know, or it was a known name under Alcoa, but it's not a stock that I particularly would have a lot of faith in uh, believing that the long-term predictability would be good. With my next example here, I'm going to look at Eagle Materials Inc. This is in construction materials. Once again, what I really want you to focus on here, again, this is not an industry that I favor a lot, but what I want you to see here is how the price tracks the company's operating results and how the business results drive the stock prices. But I also want you to see how pricing can get really crazy. You got a high period of overvaluation. Earnings did well. The company went undervalued. Then we had several years of dropping earnings coming into the recession. The stock price reacted. And coming out of the recession, we had you know three really exceptional years. And of course, that got people excited. That was followed by a massive correction again, had overvaluation and a correction. 
it. Again, these are not the kind of companies that I consider, you know, suitable for long-term buy and hold investing. That's Eagle Materials. My next example is Nucor, a steel company. And once again, you're going to see what I mean when I'm saying this industry is very, very difficult. Earnings results are extremely erratic. The dividend here flatlined for all these years. The company's forecast to have dropping earnings over the next couple of years. So that would be a big red flag as far as I'm concerned. If you look at the analyst scorecard on this company, the analysts have missed estimates on both the one year forward and a two year forward more than they've actually got it right. So again, a very, very difficult company to invest in and try to forecast what it might be in the future. It's why I don't like commodity based companies. With my next example, I'm going to look at Owens Corning, you know, primarily con they call it construction murals, but it was also glass items. This is probably one of the better stocks in this area that I'm covering today. You can see there is still cyclicality in the earnings. They did start paying a dividend in calendar year 2014. The company's dividend has grown moderately. Let's go ahead and look at the performance. The dividend growth has been about 7.5% on average or compounded over this time. It has underperformed the market in both dividend income as well as capital appreciation. But I do want to emphasize that that's also because the stock is very undervalued right now. So this would be one you might want to consider just based on its attractive valuation. But again, it's not a company that I would have a great deal of confidence in. With my next example, let's take a look at Reliance steel and aluminum company. And once again, what I'm really trying to emphasize with this particular set of companies is look how the price ultimately goes where the company's operating results go. It does get disconnected from time to time, but you can really see that it's business results that are much more important than just short-term price movements in the longer run. The problem is the longer run is totally unpredictable with these kind of companies. My next example is Southern Copper. And this one is really interesting to me because look how cyclical this stock is, but look at the dividend pattern. This company has paid out, you know, in some cases, their payout ratio has actually been well over 100% of what the company earned. That's, I guess you could call that good, but then that was usually followed by these massive dividend cuts. Dividends go from two and a half to three dollars and seventy cents, down to sixty cents, down to eighteen cents. Again, it's the complete lack of predictability here. So when you're looking at forecasting, you have a really nice forecasting graph here that looks like this stock would be very attractive. But then when you check the analyst scorecard, you find out that the analysts are missing, or in other words, this company underperformed analyst estimates about seventy percent of the time. So that means I wouldn't put too much credence on this. I'm not saying these are horrible companies. I'm just saying. These these are not buy and hold long term investors, you know, for long term investors, they're, they're way too unpredictable in my way of thinking. And finally, my last example in this particular non energy mineral sector would be West Fraser Timber Company. These are very interesting stocks. I've just never been able to find myself capable of investing in them. There's theoretically some, you know, unharvested value that these companies might have in their real estate and their timberlands, etc. But again, nothing going on in the stock price. Look how this price flatlined all these years. Look how irrelevant the operating earnings were. And even the dividend income has been very, very inconsistent where they had these, you know, strong cuts followed by some big leads and they had a frozen dividend for several years. It did generate about as much income over this time frame as the market slightly better and actually did outperform the market. So it's not that these are always bad investments. That's not really what I'm saying. What I'm saying is they're very unpredictable and they're very hard to stay into because you're going to be getting some earnings reports here that are really crazy. And Anyway, this is Chuck Karn of Al covering the non-energy mineral sector as part number 13 of ultimately 20 sectors in this series I'll be covering. This is not one of my favorites, clearly. I just think these companies are too cyclical. These would be stocks that you might want to trade, buy and sell if you felt like you could time, you know, the, the peaks and valleys well enough. But I'm not a fan of that type of investing. But I did want you to mainly see here that it is a market of stocks and not a stock market. And regardless of the fact that we've been in a bull market, there's been a lot of differences you've seen here in just the eight companies. Companies I covered in this sector and these various subsectors. It is clearly a market of stocks, not a stock market. It has been Chuck Carnival saying thanks for watching.